Hello, this is a video about the Quebec 1-bit 1 instruction transistor CPU that you can see here. In this video I'd like to talk a little bit about the dynamic behavior of the CPU, in other words what happens when in terms of subsystems used within the CPU. So let's take a look. Let's draw the CPU, the ROM and the RAM with all the connections between all of those and uh, the subsystems of the CPU. This will take some time. There's a ROM at the top, let's say that. There's a RAM at the bottom. The CPU is connected to the ROM using its progress, uh, sorry, program counter output. And uh, the ROM is connected back to the CPU using the branch address input. What all that means is uh, discussed in another video. Between the CPU and the RAM, there's a 1-bit data line and also a 1-bit write line to let the RAM know whether the CPU wants to read or write to the RAM. Read from or write to. So, um, subsystems within the CPU. There is a multiplexer. There's an address latch consisting of two halves. Let's paint them like that. Block with an L. As an address increment unit, let's draw that like that. Branch address input is connected uh, as one of the multiplexer inputs. All this stuff, all this, uh, all these arrows are 16 bit wide, and uh, all the intermediate arrows as well. So all the address stuff is 16 bits wide. Yeah. On the right is the data stuff, which is basically a D-latch with a non-inverting and an inverting output. The non-inverting output is simply used to select the multiplexer. And uh, the inverting output is fed back to the latch input or to the data line of the RAM rather using a resistor. So that's basically what it looks like. Now again, what's, what each subsystem does is uh, discussed in another video. Yeah, we won't do that here. In short, let's write down what the CPU does each instruction cycle. So first, the data bit is inverted. So the data bit is replaced with the inverse of the data bit. After that, if the data bit is 1 after inversion, the program counter is simply incremented, and else if the data bit is 0 after inversion, the program counter is replaced with the contents of the branch address. So that's all. Now to see what happens when, let's uh, consider a clock input to the CPU. The CPU has an external clock input, and uh, let's look at 4 or 5 consecutive clock pulses. Like that. Let's label them 0, 1, 2, and 3, and this would be 4. Right, now uh, let's assume it's a good idea to place an overlay over all this, like that, so we can draw on top of the drawing. A little bit of glare, but uh, I think that's acceptable. The CPU divides this incoming clock into four separate pulses, the first of which, let's call it P0, corresponds to the first out of each four consecutive clock pulses, like that. And what happens at P0, or uh, well, let's say P0 signal is connected to this latch. So this latch has an enable input, like that. And uh, let's start off by stating that the right input to the RAM, uh, the right input, the, the right output of the CPU is zero. In other words, the RAM drives this data line. And let's say the value at the data line is X, so that's zero or one. Now, when this latch receives a pulse 
on the enable input it will copy its input which is X to its output which is then also X and the inverting output will have value X over bar like that now what you see is over this resistor is a voltage well it is a voltage actually because one side is X either high or low and the other side is the opposite so there will be current flowing through this resistor right it's not a big deal this x over bar doesn't influence this signal because the ram drives its output hard so uh, the output resistance the output impedance of the ram let's say that is very low so this uh, is a hard signal so once the signal goes away um, this X is present there, it's latched. The Q and Q over bar outputs of the latch are stable. And um, this multiplexer has basically then made a choice between the branch address or the incremented program counter. And that resulting value is this one. Is applied to the bottom side of this address latch to the bottom side of the first latch the bottommost latch it cannot cross this latch because this latch is closed right so this value here is basically the branch address coming in there or the current program counter incremented uh, with one Okay, that will be the next program counter value, the location of the next instruction. So that's what happens at the first clock pulse. Let's take a look at the second clock pulse. There's a corresponding signal B1, which looks like that. And what happens then? First of all, the right output of the CPU is made 1, so right becomes 1. Let's use this color. So the RAM is told to accept data instead of drive data. So it does not drive its data line anymore. So now this X over bar, which was present at the inverted output of the latch, will have a chance to drive this output. So the value that the RAM sees is X over bar, right? Because now the input impedance of the RAM, well, let's say the RAM is not driving this output, so uh, this X over bar value has a chance to drive this line, right? It's a weak drive, but it will work. Also, this value is present at the latch input D, but this latch is not activated now, so uh, the output Q and Q over bar stay put no matter what happens at the input D, so this is really irrelevant. So when this pulse occurs and goes away, the RAM, the bit in RAM will have changed from X to X over bar, right? So when this pulse is gone, right is once again zero. All right. What also happens at moment B1, let's say that, is that this latch is activated, so this latch becomes transparent. So the new program counter value can advance one step, passes from the input of the bottommost address latch to the output. So now this value right here as the next program counter. So for now we can ignore this because the choice has been made. Alright, so now the next program counter value is here in between these two latches. It cannot advance to the program counter output of the CPU because this latch is still closed, it's not activated. So that's that. So now the RAM, bit and RAM has been inverted and the multiplexer has made a choice between branch address and incremented program counter. And that value, that new value, that choice resulted, that choice is present there. 
Now the last relevant pulse, let's call that P2, would look something like that. This topmost latch is activated. In other words, a new program counter value can advance to the latch to the program counter output of the CPU. It's also true that, well, when this, when this happens, basically the ROM uh, receives a new address because the program counter output of the CPU is basically the ROM address. So this branch address input may change. And also, because there's a new program counter value being output, the program counter also is connected to the address increment unit and also serves as an input to the multiplexer. The value of this uh, multiplexer select was still present, nothing changed. So there will be a value pushing against the bottom most of the address latches. However, this latch is closed, so it stops there. So at this moment, the CPU has the new, uh, is outputting the new program counter well, the program counter for the next instruction. So basically this ends the instruction cycle. So when this pulse is, is finished, the CPU is ready to execute yet another instruction. Now, so you see that the, let's erase all this. It's starting to become a mess, but that's okay because we're finished anyway. So you see that this clock signal is uh, divided into, let's say two, uh, let's say three different signals that look like that. And also, yeah, so the first and the fifth clock pulse cause a pulse on channel P0. That's the one wire, so to say. There's also a wire P1, as we just saw, which uh, has a pulse at the second and the sixth clock pulse, for example. And there's another wire, let's call that P2, which shows a pulse at the third and seventh clock pulse, for example. So what's interesting is that between these pulses on different wires, there's a pause, as you can see, as a delay. So at no moment in time are two pulses active at the same time. Uh, that translates to that it is not possible for two, two actions to take place at the same time. So everything takes... Mm, the right subsystems are activated in turn, and in between activations there's a delay. So no two subsystems are activated at once that should not be activated at once. And that's basically how it works. Now in practice there's also uh, B3, because it's, I think, easier to divide a signal uh, four times and three maybe but uh, that's discarded it's just for debugging basically so that's how it works in short the incoming clock signal is divided into four separate pulses or let's say three plus a spare which is not used and these three pulses activate subsystems one by one and uh, implement the instruction cycle so that's all i hope you liked it a bit for uh, more information about how each subsystem works exactly, please see uh, other videos where each subsystem basically has its own video showing how it's constructed and how it works. And uh, another video that might be interesting is to see how a live example program is actually running inside the CPU in terms of the connections of the CPU. So you can see during program execution on the whiteboard what happens at the outputs and inputs of the CPU. So that's all. Hope you liked it. Let me know what you think. Feedback is always welcome. And uh, if you're interested, watch the other videos. Also, for more information, visit the Quebec site. That is www.qibec.org, which is also visible in the video description. So have a nice day. Thanks for watching and goodbye.